Hi there, Pastor Bill Evans, Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church uh, in the lovely town of Chetwin, B.C. Um, people pick this up around the country, I guess, and we're glad for that. But uh, we're really thankful to Marlon and crew that helped put this program together, that we can share some things from the Word of God as pastors in our community. And uh, so I want to share something about what I've run into a few last few weeks with pastors in our town, talking about the subject of uh, people and their Christian folk with their attitude towards the government regarding COVID lockdown and COVID shutdown and COVID uh, uh, asking for people to get vaccinated and such like that and saying they don't have that right. And so I just want to take you, if you believe in the Bible is the word of God, I want to take and show you some of the scriptures, what God says about such a subject. And uh, so uh, we want to look at that together if we can. And, and the first thing is, is that back in the Old Testament in Jewish law, there was a, a law for the leper. If somebody had leprosy, that terrible, awful disease, uh, they, they made a law and there was, you had to get checked out with the priests and, and those guys and, and they had all these rules for you. And whatever. But one of the things, you, if you had it and whatever, you had to uh, keep your head uncovered because the sores would show there. You had to stay away from people. And Leviticus 13, you can look that up in your Bible, 45 and 46. And you had to stand back and say, unclean, unclean. If anybody come near you, unclean, unclean. And then it goes on and makes a statement, you must wear something that covers your mustache. And I thought that strange when I preached on this at my church that it was, um, the, what's with covering the mustache? My wife says, that's your mask. And so, and they had to do these things. This was mandated by the law of the land. God gave the directions and the law of the land, that's what it was. Simple. Lockdown. There's another interesting story that we know well, I think. And um, uh, it, it's almost on the sketchy side <clears throat> where... The, the people of God had been blessed by uh, God in, in taking on some of the enemies as they're coming into the promised land. So they beat the enemies, and then right after that we're told these statements that are important for us to see. And it's in Numbers chapter 21, verse 5. It says, they, they went and they got into, entered right into careless selfishness. Careless, selfishness. They don't care. They care less about anything. They care more about themselves than anything else. And selfishness is what, what it was about. And what happened there was that they, they started complaining to Moses. And says, why did you bring him to, to this piece of forsaken country? There is no bread for us to eat. And he says, and we're, we loathe this food that God's been giving us. That was the manna. That was the manna. Uh, the Bible says in another place, men ate angels' food. And yes, it's daily diet of it, I guess. It's kind of sweet and all those things and, and what. But it was food and provision for them. God would eventually give them meat. God would deal with them. But their bad attitude got them in trouble. So God says, here's a predicament. I don't like your attitude. I mean, it's turned some snakes, poisonous snakes. And people would get bit. And it says an abundance of people died. An abundance of people died. You can read that. An abundance of people died. A whole bunch died. And then, so they cry, oh, God, help. Moses, do something. So Moses talks to God. Moses is told by the Lord, he says, okay, take us pole, make a brass snake, and put them on the pole. And then whoever gets bit by a snake and looks at the pole will be healed and will be spared. Does that sound sketchy or what? We say, oh, these things and all this stuff and whatever, and they worry about the sketchy part of the story. And it's just strange to our heads as pastors. We look at it and say, how do you handle being shut down? Well, it's hard. It's not as fun as having people in church and clapping hands and, and uh, hugging each other. But it is what it is. But God says, and we want to see some things as we look at this together uh, here in a few moments now as we do now. So uh, here the first thing we find is in Romans 13. There's a wonderful passage there, Romans 13, and it starts off with these words, and it says, uh, let everybody be subject to the powers that be. The powers that be means your government. And so your government is, um, are the people who have been elected into place, and they're, they're there, and they got a, a job to do, and, you know, uh, whatever. Look at the words he says. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And says, and those which are, are, are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority has opposed the ordinance of God. The word ordinance there is something that God has arranged, something that God has assigned. A child doesn't come home from school and says, teacher told me to do this for homework. Not happening. So it was an assignment. You're told to do this. It was ordained by God, arranged by God. And he says, I put the government in place, arranged it. 
Do what they tell you. He says, and they who have opposed will receive judgment upon themselves. For the rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but of evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. And uh, he carries on to talk about, uh, so follow and do what you're told, and not because you're afraid of the wrath of the government, but because of a good conscience before God. But those are the options. And God gives directs, uh, directives, and he puts threats with them. Do what you're told or get disciplined. We saw it in Numbers. And they, they, God blessed them, and what did they do? Well, we're fed up with the, eating this lovely food and whatever, and we want some help, uh, something to change. And God sent them serpents for their bad attitude. Uh, threats, uh, directives with threats. First Peter 2, uh, he goes on from there to uh, make this statement. Here's Paul's example. Here's Peter's example. And, and the scriptures agree. And look at verse 13 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether as to the king as the one in authority, or to the governors as sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, really important, a whole lot of problem with that today. Well, they're different and they what? Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Honor the king. You're told to pray for the king. You don't like the king, what he's doing? Pray for him. God can move him along in the next election or do whatever. If you don't like what's going on, you have the right to pray. But in the meantime, God says, do what the king tells you. I put him there for your, for your good. Well, we go on from there to um, another passage here that's important. Um, and in Matthew chapter 16 is a story uh, that, again, is, is pretty well known. The one part is, is not so much at the start of the chapter. Jesus talks about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Two types of people. The one were very fair. They were very stuck on themselves. Uh, they thought they were just the cat's meow. They thought that they were, they were somebody says, uh, how do you remember what a Pharisee is? Well, he looks in the mirror and he says, I'm pretty fair, I see. And he just thought there was something else. And these were the people that were actually instrumental in, in Jesus being crucified. And then the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And that's why they were Sadducee. Uh, so they, they, what, what hope do you have in life, Paul says, if there's not a resurrection from the dead one day? And the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. But these two people, Jesus is talking about them. And he says, you guys are really smart. You see a pink sky at night. Well, it's going to be a sailor's delight. Pink sky in the morn. What's that mean? That means that there's going to be a storm. It's windy and all that stuff. Uh, it comes from the south. You know that that is uh, uh, going to be warm weather again. And, and so here, he says, you guys already understand all those things. But you don't catch on the simple things. And you're kind of people that, uh, and so he says to his disciples, these guys, watch out for them and beware of their leaven. Uh, that permeates. That which permeates from them. And, and you know, we have so much stuff out there on the internet today and thrown around and you know, somebody says well there's a chart that says this well there's charts over here that say the opposite you have to use a discerning mind to figure out what god's saying and so he says be careful of that leaven and uh so of that situation so he goes on in that chapter as he's exposed them as evils in an adulterous generation uh there in two to four an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign which they're always after but he goes down to verse 21 of that chapter and beloved, he makes this kind of statement. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up. And on the third day, uh, be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter, Jesus, come with me. And they, and they leave the scene and this, that, and they, they go off stage. And, and Peter says, this isn't going to happen. This can't happen, Jesus. You're much too uh, honorable and whatever for that to happen. And, and the scripture with Mark 8's version says that Jesus turned to the other disciples and it, it seems that Peter is now behind him and he makes this well-known statement, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He calls this friend, this uh, hyperactive attention deficit Peter guy. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you're a stumbling block to me. You're something I would trip over. For you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but on men's interests. If, if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, as Peter says, it's never going to happen. Pastor Bill has no route to heaven. I'm not good enough looking. 
can't dance and I'm too fat to fly. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. You're not interested in God's interest. You're interested in man's thinking. And he rebukes him with a pretty strong word there. That's how serious it is to God that we, we take his things and just make our own ideas out of what we should do. He wants us to obey. Sing a hymn, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So we go over from there, um, and we find after Peter's pretty strong rebuke to his friend. Um, uh, that's scandalous what you're saying, the word is. It's a scandalous word, a stumbling block. My friend says, when I look in my Bible, what I see, my note says, let's get blatant. Here's the blatant part. The devil wants you, and he wants me, dead. He wants you dead. He, he, he somehow thinks that if he can get a whole bunch of people to die when, when, he, when he's in hell, it'll turn the thermostat down a bit. It's a strange, somebody made that statement. It's kind of interesting. The more people, he wants you dead. And if he doesn't get you dead, then he at least wants you out of service. He wants you confused and chasing around after things that don't count for eternity. And so he wants you dead. John 8, 43, 45. Uh, the devil's a liar. He's the father of lies. He does all this lying. And... And he tells you, don't listen to that Jesus guy. In John 10, 10, the thief, John, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal. When he steals something, he kills it. When he kills it, what's the plan? I'll destroy, whatever. So he, he steals our, our, our toys, he steals our stuff, and <coughs> we feel violated by it. And he kills and he destroys, or he steals, he kills it, wrecks things. And he, with that, he's trying to destroy us. That's his plan. In the same verse, Jesus says, he says, this one who is a deceiver in Revelation 12, 9, he's a deceiver and accuser of the brethren. Oh, you, you really fouled up there. Those things, Jesus says, that's what the devil's like. But I come that you might have life to the full. We've just celebrated Thanksgiving, lots of turkey and stuffing. And I asked young men at our church if they would um, um, understand was the word stuffing in the Bible. And the word stuffing was there because we say this verse here, God says, I want to bless you with abundance. Jesus says, I want you to have life to the full. John 3, 16, you know, I want you to have eternal life. And John 14, 27, I want you to have peace. My peace I leave with you. Stop all the worrying and struggling about fighting the government, whatever like this, and trust the Lord and follow his word. And you get to have peace like he wants you to have. God bless you. Amen.